بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. إن شاء الله continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. السيرة النبوية, the prophetic biography. In the last few sessions, we've been talking and discussing uh, about the Battle of the Trench. And then over the last few sessions, we've talked about some of the immediate aftermath of the Battle of Khandaq, the Battle of Ahzab, and some of the events that followed afterwards. Today, inshallah, we're going to be talking about the conclusion of the fifth year of Hijrah. The conclusion of the fifth year of the Prophet Wasallam's residence in the city of Medina. Now, we're not just going to be kind of wrapping up and talking about the fifth year. There are two events specifically that we'll be talking about. And what's interesting about these two events is that they are pertaining to the personal life of the Prophet ﷺ. And it goes without saying, but nevertheless I'll state the obvious, just for everyone's benefit and as a reminder, things that are in the personal life of the Prophet ﷺ are obviously relevant to each and every single person um, in the Muslim community. So meaning that the personal life of the Prophet ﷺ is authoritative, it is legislative, and the personal life of the Prophet ﷺ very much is a part of our sharia, ah, is a part of our deen, is a part of the structure and the guidance of our deen and our religion on how to live our own personal lives. So we'll be talking about two particular things from the personal life of the Prophet ﷺ. One of them it will be more of a discussion as to just to know about the personal life of the Prophet ﷺ, exactly what transpired, and about some of the notable individuals in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And then the second thing we'll talk about, even though the personal life of the Prophet ﷺ was the subject of the issue, from it came God guidance and rules and regulations that are very, very important in terms of implementation within our own families, our own homes, and our communities as well. And this is all from the end of the fifth year of Hijrah. So the first thing that we'll be talking about is the Prophet Wasallam's marriage to Zainab bint Jahsh radiallahu ta'ala anha. Now who is Zainab bint Jahsh radiallahu ta'ala anha? She is related to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. She is basically the first cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Her mother, whose name was Umayma, was the daughter of Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So that means that her mother and the father of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam were brother and sister. So she's his paternal cousin. She's his first cousin from his father's side of the family. What's mentioned about Zainab bint Jahsh radiallahu ta'ala anha was that she was a very, very early convert to Islam in the early days of Makkah. All right, so she had accepted Islam in the very beginning of the message and she was somebody who had accepted Islam very early on. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam had arranged for her to marry um, Zayd bin Haritha radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now, if you recall, Zayd bin Haritha is basically what we refer to as the adopted son of the Prophet ﷺ. And I'll be talking about that in just a minute. But Zayd bin Haritha was someone who, who basically grew up in the home of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ had raised him like a son of his own. He is mentioned to be the third person to accept Islam. After Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, the mother of the believers, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. The second one was Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And the third individual mentioned by the scholars is that Zayd bin Haritha was the third person to accept Islam. And he was very, very close to the Prophet ﷺ. He was very devoted and loyal to the Prophet ﷺ. And he, was, he had made many sacrifices for the sake of Islam. <clears throat> In fact, we talked about his biography earlier on in the podcast and in the series. If you go back, you can find the session about the first few individuals who accept Islam, where we talked about some of the, his personal life and some of his own personal history. And we talked about it there that Zayd bin Haritha radiallahu ta'ala anhu, very tragically when he was a child, had been captured by some you know, slave traders and he had been sold into slavery. 
And he had somehow made it to Mecca and he was gifted to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, who gifted him to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa at the time of their marriage. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa freed him and kept him like a son. Well, eventually Zayd's family found out about him and found out exactly where he was and they came to retrieve him. And when they came to retrieve him, he had accepted Islam, become Muslim by this time. And he himself was a teenager now, he had been raised by the Prophet ﷺ. And when they asked to take him back, he requested to stay. And he said that I would like to stay and the Prophet ﷺ hugged him and embraced him and he said, he is my son. Right, so in that manner, he was like an adopted son of the Prophet ﷺ. So he was very, very close to him and very beloved to the Prophet ﷺ. We know that he loved the Prophet ﷺ very much and that he was very dedicated to serving the Prophet ﷺ. He accompanied the Prophet ﷺ on the journey to Ta'if. Right? So whenever we talk about the story of Ta'if and the very great tragedy and difficulty the Prophet ﷺ had to deal with with the people stoning him as he was leaving Ta'if, Zayd bin Haritha was his companion, was with him and suffered along with him. But a lot of times what we don't realize is Zayd bin Haritha was extremely beloved to the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ had a nickname for him. And that was Hib. The Prophet ﷺ used to call him Hib, which means beloved, from like Hub, from love. So he used to refer to him as Al-Hib, the beloved one. And when Zayd had a son by the name of Usama, Usama ibn Zayd, the Prophet ﷺ used to refer to uh, Usama radiallahu ta'ala anhu as Hibbu Hibbi Rasulullah ﷺ. Hibbu Hibbi Nabi, the beloved of the beloved of the Prophet ﷺ. Right, so Zayd was very beloved. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha actually says in Sahih Muslim um, about, or I believe it's in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says about Zayd bin Haritha that the Prophet ﷺ had such confidence and such trust in Zayd bin Haritha that the Prophet ﷺ, if he ever sent out, so we know that the Prophet ﷺ himself, he traveled on certain campaigns, expeditions, ghazawat. So when the Prophet ﷺ was on the journey, he himself was in charge of course. He's the Amir, he's in charge, he's the leader. But whenever the Prophet ﷺ sent out a group where he personally was not with them, a Sariya, and Zayd bin Haritha was in the group, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says that the Prophet ﷺ always put Zayd in charge. If Zayd was going in a group that the Prophet ﷺ was not accompanying, then Zayd was in charge. Automatic, everyone knew the Prophet ﷺ was going to put Zayd in charge. That's how much he loved him, he trusted him, he had confidence in him. Right? So Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu is a very remarkable individual. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa seeing Zaynab bint Jahash, somebody related to him, a very early you know, person to accept Islam. And seeing Zayd, of course, somebody who is like a son to him and so beloved to him, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had, you know, matched them together and they had gotten married. The Prophet sallallahu had married them to one another. They had come from very, very different backgrounds. There are some narrations that do speak about this, that they had come from very different backgrounds. Right, that Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu had basically grown up as a child, had grown up in slavery. And, and had worked as, you know, kind of like, uh, had worked practically as a servant for a lot of his life, right? And then he didn't know his fam own family for a very long time, and he was raised by the Prophet Wasallam. So Zayd had a particular experience, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, growing up. Zainab bin Tajahash radiallahu ta'ala anha was the granddaughter of Abdul Muttalib. She's from Quraysh, from Banu Hashim, and the granddaughter of the Prophet What that means is she's basically nobility, royalty of Mecca. She was like nobility and royalty of Mecca. So she had a very different experience growing up. And so their personalities and their background really didn't, you know, match very well. And you know, one little side note, something that the scholars mentioned is part of the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this plan, because if you really think about it, if the Prophet is the one matching them and pairing them together, and it doesn't end up working out, God forbid, well ayyadu billah, could somebody criticize the Prophet Couldn't you see this? Couldn't you tell that they weren't gonna fit and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera? Right? No, 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 that's not it at all. Because the Prophet ﷺ understood that the biggest part and the most significant part of their identity was their Islam. And they both had made such sacrifices for the sake of Islam that that was the foremost part of their identity and personality. And, and their, their, their values, 
So they aligned in terms of values and that's ultimately what's important. Something that's very overlooked today. But at the same time, this is part of the divine plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to demonstrate the fact that sometimes people don't exactly click and you never really know you know, everything about someone, or you never really know how well you'll mesh and gel with someone until you actually live with them and share your life with them and go through a few experiences with them. You have a few highs and lows and that really helps you figure out the, the, the tone of things. And ultimately sometimes things do not work out. And this is something very kind of taboo to talk about within our communities. And of course, we don't go around advocating and, and uh, glorifying, you know, marital problems and divorce and things like that. Of course, God forbid, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all our families and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all our marriages. But at the same time, it is a reality of life that is present at the time of the Prophet ﷺ in the community of the Sahaba amongst the family of the Prophet ﷺ. To remind us of the fact that sometimes things don't work out. And when things don't work out, then contrary to how, you know, a lot of our, the subcultures within, our, within the Muslim community work, where, you know, no matter what happens, no matter how, you know, difficult things are, no matter how incompatible two people are, you know what, that's it, till death do us part. And it usually ends up, and I don't mean to make light of a very difficult situation, it usually ends up in being, you know, till death do us part, so we might as well expedite the death part of it. Right? And it, it ends up becoming more of a tragic situation, and more people are embroiled, and not only two individuals, but sometimes an entire family, and sometimes two extended families are completely obliterated, and engulfed for decades within such a tragic situation. Right? So that's why we do have a mechanism to basically work our way out from a very difficult situation. And again, I want to emphasize that this is not something we glorify, this is not something we take lightly, but at the same time, this is something that we approach very maturely and with a very sophisticated, mature, intelligent attitude. Right? And so this happens at the time of the Prophet ﷺ where Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha are not compatible, things are not working out. And so Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, you know, it, uh, talks to the Prophet ﷺ about some of the difficulties and struggles that they're having. And the Prophet ﷺ, you know, uh, advises her, counsels her and, and uh, consoles her. Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu talks to the Prophet ﷺ about some of the difficulties he's facing in the marriage. And once again, the Prophet ﷺ counsels him, consoles him, comforts him, and encourages him to try to work through the issues. Ultimately, at the end of the day, things, and the Qur'an refers to this, amsik alayka zawjaka wa taqillah, that you said, Allah says in the Qur'an, you said to Zayd, that stay in your marriage for now, try to work through the issues, and fear God, be God conscious. So be, be a good person and try to work through the issues. But realizing that ultimately it might not work out. And so there are different narrations about how long they were married. Some of the more authentic narrations seem to allude to the fact that they were married for about a year. And after about a year, they basically separated. So they separated, the divorce was formalized, and they were able to move on. And again, just to explain a very difficult situation, one that I know is very uncomfortable and difficult for us to talk about, what is the outcome of this situation? You have two individuals who are just not compatible, things are not working. Things are not working. So rather than to lock them in and say, no, absolutely not, you can never exit this situation, Right? They get somebody responsible, mature, sophisticated, intelligent, involved, and that is the Prophet ﷺ, the most sophisticated, intelligent human being of all time, to kind of counsel them and help them maturely and calmly work through the issues. And ultimately, when it does not work out, how does it end up working out? And I'll go ahead and mention Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha does get remarried to none other than the Prophet ﷺ, which is what we'll talk about in a minute. And Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu does get remarried, and he marries none other than Baraka. A woman by the name of Baraka, she was known by the name, the nickname of Ummu Ayman, the title of Ummu Ayman. And Ummu Ayman was the nanny of the Prophet ﷺ. She was the caretaker of the Prophet ﷺ when he was a child. And he used to refer to her as mother. Ya Ummah, O oh Mother. 
And he respected her very, very much. The Prophet ﷺ said about her, you know, at the time Zayd got married to her, that whoever wants to marry a woman of paradise will marry Ummu Ayman. She's a guaranteed woman of paradise. So they both did end up getting remarried. And they ended up marrying into situations that were very, very remarkable and fruitful and enjoyable, blissful and happy, and extended to eternal bliss and happiness of the Akhirah and the life of the hereafter. So there's a very sobering lesson here in regards to this that we have to have. And this is not for just anyone to figure out just kind of on the go and on the fly and make that assessment of who should stay married and who should get divorced. This is of course a decision that has to be made by those individuals and has to involve the count of some intelligent, qualified, mature, sophisticated individuals, counselors and whatnot, right? But ultimately at the end of the day, we have to understand at a mature level that this is a part of, you know, the, the legislation of our religion and our deen. That this is also a mechanism built into our religion and deen. Because sometimes it's deemed necessary. Wallahu ta'ala alamu bis sawab. So now moving forward, as the Prophet, uh, so as Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha are divorced and they separate, and Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha fulfills the waiting period after the divorce. At that particular time, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, there are a few very special commands that are revealed to the Prophet ﷺ within the Qur'an. And they are found in Surah number 33, Surah Al-Ahzab. The first rule that is revealed to the Prophet ﷺ is, اُدْعُوهُمْ لِآبَائِهِمْ هُوَ أَقْسَطُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ And what that basically means is that if anyone has adopted a child, if anyone has adopted a child, taking care of a child that maybe had lost their family, lost their parents, or whatever the circumstance may have been, or a very tragic situation like Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu's case, then in that situation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphasizing and commanding that the child needs to be called by the name of the father. Which means you have to confirm and you have to maintain the lineage of the, of, the, of the child, the actual biological lineage of the child. And what that means is, the adopted father does not, become the bio, does not replace the biological father. And the adopted mother does not replace the biological mother. And so the outcome and the consequence of this is a few things. Number one, if the name of the child is already known. So in the case of Zayd, you knew that his name was Zayd bin Haritha. Zayd the son of Haritha. The Prophet ﷺ had raised him and basically adopted him and taken care of him and taken guardianship of him. So many people used to refer to him as Zayd ibn Muhammad. Zayd bin Muhammad. Zayd the son of Muhammad. And so this was being corrected that no, you know his father's name, so you must refer to him as Zayd ibn Haritha. And he was, he kind of felt a little sad that, you know, his name was no longer associated with the name of the Prophet ﷺ. So then he was referred to as Zayd Mawla Rasulullah ﷺ. Zayd, the associate of the Prophet ﷺ. Because he was freed from slavery by the Prophet ﷺ. So he was known as Zayd Mawla Rasulullah ﷺ. Zayd, the associate or the affiliate of the Prophet ﷺ. And another, obviously, the Prophet ﷺ gave him the nickname Hibbu Rasulullah ﷺ. Zayd, the beloved of the Prophet ﷺ, which is even more beautiful, right? So that's the first rule of the outcome. The second rule of, uh, the second outcome of this particular rule, that adopted relations do not supersede or overtake or even replace biological relations. The second consequence of this particular rule was the fact that the relationships or the rules that are an outcome of biological relationships are, do not necessarily occur due to adopted relationships. So for example, for instance, if there is a biological father and his son, his own biological son, if the son gets married to a woman, and then that the son and the daughter-in-law of this man, they divorce. They divorce. The things didn't work out and they divorce. The son divorces his wife. The wife, the former daughter-in-law, can never ever ever be married to her ex or former father-in-law. They can never be joined in marriage. That is not permissible, that is not allowed. 
That is the outcome of biological relationships. However, adopted relationships do not have that same rule. Okay, we know other rules in regards to the uh, issues of hijab and having like uh, certain limitations physically and pri in terms of privacy, right? With the opposite gender, there are rules and regulations in place. Well, biological siblings, biological siblings don't have those rules and restrictions and boundaries between them, right? A brother and a sister, sister doesn't have to wear hijab in front of the brother. Right? They can actually make physical contact with each other. Right? There's nothing prohibiting that. However, if there is a family and they have a daughter, a biological daughter, and they adopt a boy, they adopt a son, that will just them adopting this, the boy will not automatically create that sibling dynamic between them. When they become adults, when they grow up, they will have to maintain certain boundaries and privacy with each other. Okay, they are not automatically like biological siblings. So these are a few rules, a few outcomes, and there's a whole discussion behind it. It's a whole discussion of fiqh in and of itself. Now and here is not really the time to get into it. But nevertheless, there are a few outcomes of this. So this is the first rule that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instituted, that adopted children are not the same as biological children in terms of the rules and the fiqh that is involved. You know, inheritance is another one of those things. Right, that inheritance automatically occurs for one's biological children. It does not automatically occur for the adopted children. Rather, you have to write them into your will. But they don't automatically inherit. So all these rules were instituted now because of this. Right? Many people, and that's why there's a little bit of a misunderstanding in the Muslim community due to mistranslation. Right? This is why, because of this particular rule, this word, the word for it in Arabic is at-tabanni. At-tabanni means to declare someone to be your biological child when they are not your biological child. That is forbidden in Islam. You cannot take someone else's child and proclaim them to be now officially your child. You can't do that. Okay? However, people translated the word tabanni as adoption. And that's why in some of the early like English translation of a lot of our fiqh, the common perception or the common idea amongst Muslims was that adoption is not permissible in Islam. And that is false, that is not correct. Because the actual understanding of adoption is kafala. To take care of a child. To take guardianship of a child, to look after a child. Right? And that is something that is not only permissible, but encouraged in Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ana, he says him, the Prophet ﷺ, he, وَكَافِلُوا yatim, And somebody who takes care of an orphan, adopts an orphan, kahatain will be like these two fingers, together in paradise. Right? So it's very, very encouraged. Right? But the idea is, yes, if adoption is understood to be taking care of, you know, a child, then that is not only allowed, but also encouraged. But you cannot assume that child to be the biological child. And you cannot apply the rules of a biological child to an adopted child. Okay, so those were some of the rules, that, the, the legislation that was revealed in the Qur'an in Surah number 33. The outcome of this was everyone came to realize that Zayd is very beloved to the Prophet ﷺ. He was cared for by the Prophet ﷺ, but he is not the actual biological son of Muhammad ﷺ. Now that that understanding occurred, now what ends up happening is that Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu and then Zainab, who is a muhajira, who has left Mecca, come to Medina, an early convert to Islam, has been you know, ostracized and outcast by many of her own family and community, like many of the Meccan Muslims, and she's now divorced from a marriage that was recommended by the Prophet ﷺ. And on top of that, there are some narrations, um, Ibn Kathir ta'ala has compiled them and gathered them together, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Prophet ﷺ that after Zainab is done with the waiting period, you should marry her. You will marry her. In fact, the wording in the narration, Allah in the Qur'an says, زَوَّجْنَاكَهَا We have already married you to her. We have already married you to her. And that's why I, uh, Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha used to brag and used to kind of talk about the fact that everyone's marriages happen on the earth, my marriage happened in the heavens. Everyone's nikah is performed by a human being, my nikah was performed, my ceremony was officiated by Allah Himself. 
Zawajnakah. Right? So, and some narrations have been Kathir rahmallahu ta'ala even goes as far as saying that like Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was shown in a dream to the Prophet sallallahu that this will be your wife. Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha was also shown to the Prophet sallallahu that she will be your wife. So following the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and implementing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already made official through the revelation of the Qur'an, the Prophet sallallahu became uh, was married to Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. What happened at this particular time was, and you have to understand, part of divine legislation and part of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu was to challenge some of the incorrect practices, challenge the incorrect practices that were there before Islam, and that agitates the, the predominant culture at a time. That will always agitate the culture. Right? Whenever people are, you know, correcting wrongs within society and displaying a conduct and a behavior that goes against the grain of the community of the society, and they are trying to implement a more moral, ethical lifestyle, that will always agitate the popular and the predominant culture. And that was part that was basically the life mission of the Prophet ﷺ, to challenge a lot of the incoherent and inappropriate and um, you know, uh, incorrect practices before. And so now that the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ marries Zainab bint Jahash radiallahu ta'ala anha, the mushrikun of Makkah start to spread rumors. Oh, look what happened. Look what he did. He married his son's ex-wife. And some of the munafiqun also started to spread these rumors and talk about, inappropriately speak about the Prophet And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this entire situation in the Qur'an as well. In Surah Al-Ahzab, in Ayahs 37 and 38, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That remember the time when you said to the one that God blessed, referring to Zayd by making him Muslim, وَأَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِ And you had also done him a huge favor by freeing him from slavery and looking after him and raising him. أَمْسِكْ عَلَيْكَ زوجك. You had told him, please don't divorce your wife yet, try to work through your issues. وَاتَّقِ اللَّهِ And be conscious of Allah. And then Allah says something very interesting, وَتُخْفِي فِي نَفْسِكَ مَا اللَّهُ مُبْدِيهِ and you were concealing within yourself what God had intended all along to bring out into the open. Now, some scholars have discussed here, what does that mean? Does that mean that Allah had already told the Prophet ﷺ, this is what needs to happen, and the Prophet ﷺ was holding back? Because that's not appropriate. That's impossible. If Allah commands something, the Prophet ﷺ has to comply. Okay? What it means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told him, this is how things will eventually end. Because, and that's why Ibn Kathir says that he saw this in a dream. Because the dreams of the Prophet ﷺ many times would foretell of events to come. So Allah had told him that this is eventually how things will happen. The Prophet ﷺ just not, تُخْفِي فِي نَفْسِكَ means he had not disclosed and shared that with anyone yet. And then it says something very interesting, وَتَخْشَ nas. If you literally translate وَتَخْشَ nas, it would be translated as you were, you, you are afraid of the people. وَالْعَيَاذُ billah. And that's not an appropriate translation. The Prophet ﷺ is not afraid of the people. But taqsha nasa, if you understand the context and you understand the Arabic language, what it means is that you were apprehensive about how the people would react. You were apprehensive about how the people would react. All right? And that definitely was there and was true. And the Prophet ﷺ proved to be correct in his expectations of the people. But then Allah says, Wallahu ahaqu an taqsha. You should, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more deserving of you to worry about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said about this situation. Pay more attention to what Allah has said. Don't worry about how the people will react. Now, we don't talk about the Prophet in a, in a very forward and direct way. Allah can speak to His Habib sallallahu however He chooses. And actually Allah is not even reprimanding the Prophet ﷺ, He's more so providing us a reminder through the example of the Prophet ﷺ. Wallahu ahaqu an taqsha. Then it goes on to say, فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِنْهَا وَطَرًا That after Zayd had divorced his wife, زَوَّجْنَاكَهَا 
we married her to you. لكي لا يكون على المؤمنين حرج في أزواج أدعيائهم إذا قضوا منهن وترى so that there would no longer be any type of difficulty or adversity you know for the believers in regards to these adopted relationships like it specifically mentions that if an, ad an adopted son had was married to a woman and then was divorced that now this man is now not allowed or this man and woman are no longer allowed to be married this was removing that and overall removing all the difficulty and the adversity and the unnecessary restrictions that were coming because of adopted relationships taking care of people وَكَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ مَفْعُولًا And what God has commanded, what God has issued and decreed, will come to pass. مَا كَانَ عَلَى نَبِيِّ مِنْ حَرَجٍ فِي مَا فَرَضَ اللَّهُ لَهُ And there is no, there is no criticism, there is no harm, there, is no, there should be no hesitation on the part of the Prophet ﷺ to carry through what Allah has ordained upon him. Sunnat Allahi fi alladheena khalaw min qabl that this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala corrected the abhorrent practices of the nations of the past. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala corrects trends. He sends prophets, He sends messengers, He sends these remarkable and influential people who come and correct the culture of humanity at that time. وَكَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ قَدَرًا مَقَدُورًا And everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does is calculated and precise. Is exact and precise. So this is exactly how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had planned out this entire scenario and situation. So in this situation now, of course the Prophet sallallahu married, uh, you know, Zainab bint Jahash radiallahu ta'ala anha. And what I'll mention um, is just some of the virtues of Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, because as being a mother of the believers, she became a mother of the believers, so we should know a little something about her. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha um, used to compliment uh, Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha uh, very, very, you know, she was always a lot, full of a lot of praise for Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. Uh, so much so that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said that, Yes, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says that um, that Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha فَعَسَمَهَ اللَّهُ بِالْوَرْعِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had granted her a lot of, you know, God consciousness and piety. Aisha says that Zainab was a very, very pious woman. That when, and something that we're going to talk about in the next few sessions, we're coming up to it, but when Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was slandered, when the false accusation was made against her. And the Prophet ﷺ asked Zainab, what is your opinion of Aisha? Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha says that, Ya Rasulullah, ahmi sam'i wa basari. I try not to delve into other people's business. I try to guard my ears and my eyes. I try not to get into other people's business. But she said, ma alimtu illa khairan. I cannot say a single bad thing about Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. So she was a very pious and a very honest woman. Not only that, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says about her, Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, her name originally was Barra. Barra. <clears throat> which kind of means like the outdoors. Right? And so the Prophet ﷺ said that is not a good name. So the Prophet ﷺ changed her name to Zainab. That's how she was given the name Zainab. And her nickname, her title was Umul Hakam, the mother of wisdom. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says about her in a hadith of Sahih Muslim, مَا رَأَيْتُ إِمْرَأَةً قَدْتُ خَيْرًا فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ زَيْنَبِ I never saw a woman with better deen and religion than Zainab. Never in my life. وَأَتْقَى لِلَّهِ I never saw a woman more conscious of Allah than Zainab. وَأَصْدَقَ حَدِيثًا I never met a woman who was more truthful than Zainab. وَأَوْصَلَ لِلْرَحِمْ I never met a woman who maintained her family relations more than Zainab. وَأَعْضَمَ أَمَانَةً وَصَدَقَةً And I never met a woman who was more trustworthy than Zainab, and I never met a woman that was more generous and charitable than Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. So much so that it's also mentioned from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha in a hadith of Sahih Muslim as well, that the Prophet said to his wives before he passed away, before he left this world, when his wives were gathered around him, he said to his wives, أَسْرَعُ كُنَّ لُحُوقًا بِي أَطْوَلُ كُنَّ يَدًا 
that the first amongst you to come and join me in the life of the hereafter, in the afterlife, will be the one with the longest hands. Will be the one with the longest arms or the longest hands. فَكُنَّا نَتَعَطَّوَلُوا أَيُّنَا أَتَوَلُوا يَدًا So Aisha رضي الله تعالى عنها said that we actually stood up and started measuring our arms against each other. But she says, فَكَانَتْ زَيْنَبْ أَتَوَلُوا يَدْ أَتَوَلُنَا يَدًا She says, but in reality, when we understood what it meant, that Zainab had the longest arms, meaning لِأَنَّهَا كَانَتْ تَعْمَلْ بِيَدِهَا وَتَتَصَدَّقْ Because she used to, listen to this, Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was a mother of the believers. She is a mother of the believers, a wife of the Prophet She used to work jobs, she used to make things, and do jobs with her hand for payment, to earn money with her own hands, and then give it in charity. Not even the allowance that was provided for her from the Baytul Mal, after the Prophet ﷺ, the allowance that was provided for her as a family of the Prophet ﷺ, that was fine. She took very minimal enough to just you know feed herself, take pay her own bills. But when she wanted to give sadaqah, she would not even give from that money. Because she said, why would I take from the public fund and give sadaqah? Where's the generosity in that? Where's the sacrifice in that? So she used to work jobs, make things with her own hands, sell them, do work for people, earn money, and then give it in sadaqah. And she insisted on doing so. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, that's who the Prophet ﷺ was referring to as the one with the longest arms. And Al-Waqidi mentions, and many others mention, Ibn Kathir and others, that Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha passed away in the year 20 after Hijrah. So she passed away 10 years after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Umar ibn, during the time of the Khilafah of Umar bin al-Khattab, he led her janaza prayer radiallahu ta'ala anha, and she was buried um, in, the, in the graveyard of al-Baqiya. And where she was buried is basically eventually became the area that is preserved and maintained till today, where all the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are buried, all the mothers of the believers were buried. So this is basically the story about the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ to Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. Now I will mention and clarify one little misconception here that was actually popularized and propagated by a lot of the Orientalist writings that came out of Europe a couple of hundred years ago. And even some Muslim writers and Muslim authors made the tragic mistake of narrating this incident further on. And it is classified as being fabricated, it is mawdur, it's false. It has no sanad, it has no basis, it has no foundation. We don't know where it came from, somebody made it up and it just became popularized. So we should be very careful about it. That there is a story, there is a narration, supposedly, and it's false. We've confirmed the fact that it's false. So there's a story that's told that the Prophet wasallam, before Zayd got divorced from Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, that the Prophet wasallam came to visit Zayd, and Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha was in the home, and she wasn't properly covered or whatever. And the Prophet wasallam came in and he saw Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, and he was you know, struck and fascinated by how beautiful she was. And that then led to Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu becoming divorced from Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha and the Prophet sallallahu marrying Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. And it doesn't even stop there. These people who slander and say false things about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa they don't stop at any end. They go as far as saying then in the Ghazwa Muta, which we will be talking about later on, uh, uh, one of the major campaigns during the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sent Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu as a leader of the army, and he was martyred, he was shaheed over there, that they go as far as saying, and to get rid of Zayd because he had some lingering like you know bad feelings towards the Prophet ﷺ and Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha that he sent him out on this army basically on a suicide mission so that he would die. وَالْعَيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ الْعَيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ God forbid. Right? It's, 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 it's false and it's ugly and it's detestable. Right? But the Prophet ﷺ cried when he heard about the news of Zayd radiallahu anhu being shaheed. And the Prophet ﷺ hugged 
Usama bin Zayd radiyallahu ta'ala anhu and told him, don't worry, I'm here for you. I'll look after you, I'll take care of you. And the Prophet sallallahu the Qur'an is saying, amsik alayka zawjak. He, he, he was telling Zayd, no, no, don't divorce your wife, don't divorce your wife, don't divorce your wife. And that story or incident that is told is completely baseless and fabricated. So that clarifies a major misconception that a lot of people have and we should be very careful about that. The last thing that I'll mention and I'll conclude with this insha'Allah is at the time of the Prophet Wasallam's marriage to Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, one major command that's in the Qur'an that is very important in a family and social setting, in a communal setting, came down at that time. And what the story is, it's narrated by Anas bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And it's mentioned in the books of Bukhari and Muslim and all the major books of Sirah that when the Prophet ﷺ was married to Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, Anas bin Malik, the young Sahabi who was like the personal assistant of the Prophet ﷺ, the Khadim of the Prophet ﷺ, his mother who was, who was called Umm Sulaim, she prepared some, some food. Just a little bit of food, like just a tray of like sweet. It was, it was referred to as hais, where you would take dates and milk and butter and things like that and kind of cook it and mix it up. And almost like, a, think of like a porridge, right? Or, or for the Desi folks, kheer, right? Kind of like something sweet like that. So it was prepared like that and she just prepared like one little tray. It was not very big, it was very small. She prepared it and she gave it to her son Anas and she said, please take this to the Prophet wasallam, because they just got married so that him and his wife have something nice to eat and also a few family members, they can share some food with them as a celebration, right, for the marriage. So she said that, take this to the Prophet wasallam, And she said, وَأَخْبِرُ أَنَّ هَذَا مِنَّا لَهُ قَلِيلٌ she said, let him know that this is very little, but this is all we can afford. And Anas says that, when nasu yawma idin fi jahdin. The financial and the economic situation in Medina was still very, very tough. Very, very tough. People were barely getting by. So Jesus made a small little plate, a small little tray, and she said it and she apologized, said this is all we can afford, but please, this is something for you to enjoy, you know, to celebrate the wedding. So I, he says, I went to the Prophet ﷺ and he said that, Umm Sulaim, I sent this to you. And she says, Salam to you. And she says, let you know that, you know, we're very sorry, it's very little, but this is all we can afford. The Prophet ﷺ looked at it and he said, okay, put it down. And he said, I put it down in the house. And then he said, Izhab fad'u li fulanan wa fulanan. Fasamma rijalan kathiran. The Prophet ﷺ said, put it down. And then he said, okay, now go get so and 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 so. And he said, he just rattled off like a huge guest list. And so I said that, and, and then at the end of it he said, وَمَنْ لَقِيْتَ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And anybody else you come across in the streets, just tell them to come on over. I said, okay, سَمِعْنَا وَاطَعْنَا So I went and I called everyone, and everybody that I came across. And he said, when I got to the home of the Prophet ﷺ, he said the entire home of the Prophet ﷺ was full of people and there was a line of people outside. And so somebody asks him, one of the students of Anas, who he's telling this story to, asks him, Kam kanu, how many people do you think there were? And he said, kanu zuha'a There were at least 300 people. Let's keep in mind, there's one plate of food, 300 people. So then the Prophet ﷺ sat down and he said, Ji bihi. He said, bring it to me, the food. And he said, I took it to him. And the Prophet ﷺ put his hand on it and he made dua. And he said, Masha Allah, Masha Allah. Masha Allah, Masha Allah. Right? The Prophet said that. And then he said, Liyatahallak asharatun asharatun wa yusammu. Tell them to circle around, sit together, kind of like form like little circles of 10, 10 people. And start passing the dish around to 10 people at a time. And tell them to say Bismillah before they eat. وَلِيَأْكُلْ كُلُّ إِنسَانٍ مِمَّا يَلِهِ And everyone should only eat from in front of them. Right? So eat with etiquette, say Bismillah, eat from in front of them. And MashaAllah, go. 
And so he said that people started to eat and then there, after a while I, I would put it down and they would eat for a little while, Bismillah, and they would eat. And then the Prophet ﷺ would say, Irfa'ahu. Okay, now move on. And then I would pick it up and I would take it over to uh, the next group, the next group, the next group, the next group. And in this way, 300 people ate from that one dish. And at the end and at the conclusion of it, the Prophet ﷺ, everyone had eaten, most of the people they, you know, said, you know, Alhamdulillah, and they thanked the Prophet ﷺ, and they congratulated him, and they left. Some of the narrations mentioned that about a few people, a handful of people, some narrations even mentioned it was as small as three, right? That about three people or a few people, they basically kind of were sitting there, and they were just chit-chatting, they were talking, and they just kind of, you know how you get comfortable after a while? Just lean back, and then you start to chill. And then you start to hang out and you start to talk about what's going on and what's going on and what's going on. And they just started, you know, having long conversations. And the Prophet ﷺ kind of sat there quietly. And it mentions, and Anas says, وَكَانَ أَشَدَّ النَّاسِ حَيَاءً The Prophet ﷺ was the most dignified, modest, humble individual you ever met in your entire life. So, Telling someone to leave your house, it just wasn't within the capacity of the Prophet So he sat there very quietly. But Anas says that, I could recognize the fact that he was getting a little, you know, he was tired. He, the, the wedding had just happened. You know, he would like to go and sit with his wife and talk to her. And this whole time, because again, you know, when we talk about our homes and maybe having some guests that stayed a little longer than we would have liked, we have like, you know, three, four different rooms, second floor, right? There's plenty of room in the house for everybody. This was a hujra. This was literally one room. And I don't mean this disrespectfully, or to guilt or shame anyone. I'm being very, I'm being very serious, just to give us a real life idea. The hujra, an apartment, of one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ was probably the size of like one of our walk-in closets. Very legitimately. And so it's just a room. And it says that Zainab anha was sitting in a corner, you know, completely kind of wrapped up, sitting facing towards the wall to kind of have a little bit of privacy. So she's like stuck in a corner. And they're just sitting there talking, they didn't really realize and that must have been part of the culture before Islam, that you just kind of sit around and you talk and you hang out. The Prophet ﷺ, after a little while, he got a little, you know, just agitated or impatient. The Prophet ﷺ got up and he went to go check on some of the other, you know, wives of the Prophet ﷺ, the other homes, the other apartments, the other families, went to go check on them. He said, let me at least make use of this time. So he just went by their doors, you know, saying, Salaam, how is everything, everything okay, everything okay? And multiple, you know, of, of the different family members of the Prophet ﷺ asked him that, how are you and Zainab enjoying each other's company? You know, how so far, how are things going? And the Prophet ﷺ was quiet in response, because he hadn't had a chance to kind of sit and talk to her one-on-one -on -one yet. And then finally, um, some of the narrations mentioned that, they, the three individuals, they left. So Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu came after the Prophet ﷺ, found him, and said to him, O Messenger of Allah, they've left, they've gone. And he says that the Prophet ﷺ, at that time, he came back home. <laughs> and this is interesting, this is kind of funny. Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that I was like on the heels of the Prophet and that was kind of his job, right? That was his job. So he says, I was right on his heels, just kind of coming along with him. And he says that when the Prophet ﷺ got to his apartment, when he got to the house, the Prophet ﷺ put one foot in, and he said, I was right behind him. And before he put his other foot in, he took the curtain and he closed the curtain and went inside. So kind of like closed the curtain on Anas. Right? Anas was a young man, he's like 15 years old at the time. He's like a son to the Prophet ﷺ, he's like his personal assistant. So he's teaching him. And he says that at that particular time, in fact, he says that he closed the curtain and I could hear him reciting the ayat. Allah had just revealed revelation to him. And he was reciting the ayat from Surah Al-Ahzab, Surah Ayahs number 53 and 54. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who believe, 
لا تدخلوا بيوت النبي Do not enter the homes of the Prophet ﷺ إلا أن يؤذن لكم unless permission has been granted to you. Because the Sahaba sometimes used to feel such a close and personal relationship with the Prophet ﷺ that they felt like he was like a father figure to them and they felt so close to him that they just started acting as if like it was just their own home and they would just walk right in. So Allah said, لا, Do not enter in unless permission has been granted to you. إِلَّا أَن يُؤْذَنَ لَكُمْ إِلَىٰ طَعَامٍ غَيْرَ نَاظِرِينَ إِنَاهُ And even if you are called to maybe have some food, do not look into the container of the food, see how much food he has, he doesn't have. So when you, don't go into his home until you're invited. When you are invited in, then don't be nosy and snooping around his house. Right? But have some decorum, have some, have some you know, respect. وَلَكِنْ إِذَا دُعِيتُمْ But if you're invited, that's fine. فَدْخُلُوا Come on in. فَإِذَا طَعِمْتُمْ Once you've eaten food, فَانْتَشِرُوا فَانْتَشِرُوا Then leave. وَلَا مُسْتَأْنِسِينَ لِحَدِيثِ Don't sit around just talking for another extra hour. إِنَّ ذَلِكُمْ كَانَ يُؤْذِ النَّبِيِّ You were discomforting the Prophet ﷺ. You were inconveniencing him. فَيَسْتَحْيِ مِنْكُمْ But he was too shy to say anything to you. He's too dignified to say anything to you. He's too shy. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاللَّهُ لَا يَسْتَحْيِ مِنَ الْحَقِّ But Allah does not shy away from stating the truth. Allah will tell you like it is. Right? And then He said, وَإِذَا سَأَلْتُمُهُنَّ مَتَاعًا Sometimes you might need something from one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. You need to request something. فَاسْأَلُوهُنَّ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حِجَابٍ Then ask from behind the curtain. Ask from outside the door. Don't barge into the house of the Prophet ﷺ. Ya Umm al-Mu'mineen, I need... No, no, no. Stand outside the door. My name, my name is so-and-so. Ya Umm al-Mu'mineen, I am requesting such and such. Right? Respect their privacy. They serve you. They serve you. They take care of you. They work for you. They cry for you. They, they, they care for you. But you have to still respect their privacy and their dignity. ذَلِكُمْ أَطْحَرُ لِقُلُوبِكُمْ وَقُلُوبِهِمْ وَقُلُوبِهِمْ That is better for you and better for them. Right? That that keeps, allows you to conduct yourself properly and not take them for granted. And that also makes sure that they don't end up harboring some ill feeling towards you. وَمَا كَانَ لَكُمْ أَن تُؤْذُوا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَلَا أَن تَنْكِحُوا أَزْوَاجَكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ أَبَدًا And always, at all costs, no matter what it takes, Avoid discomforting and inconveniencing the Prophet ﷺ. He serves you, he does so much for you, but you should not take him for granted. And then it goes on to mention one of the rules, that nobody is allowed after the Prophet ﷺ to marry the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. إِنَّ ذَلِكُمْ كَانَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَظِيمًا That is unacceptable in the eyes of God. These are very, very important rules Allah says. إِن تُبْدُوا شَيْءًا أَوْ تُخْفُوهُ Whether you do something publicly or you do something privately, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always fully aware of each and every single thing. So this incident and situation, took place at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam marriage to Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. These verses were revealed at this particular time. And the reason why I um, really felt, aside from it being very, very you know, notable and important and something from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I also felt this was uh, important to mention and kind of give it, to, uh, give it some specific and due attention. Because these rules in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Ahzab, and this story from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, teaches us some very important rules about how we interact in the community, how we interact with friends, and, and even family. That we have to respect privacy, we have to respect boundaries, we have to be respectful of other people's homes, and their, their families, and their boundaries, and their belongings. And it is very, very common, and it's actually a good thing to share food and to invite people over and to call people over and to go over to other people's homes. When they invite you, the Prophet ﷺ says the right of a Muslim on another Muslim is when a Muslim invites you that you accept their invitation. You accept their invitation and you go. But it's important that when you do go, then you conduct yourself properly. You be an exemplary guest. The Prophet ﷺ taught us to be an exemplary host, but he also taught us to be an exemplary guest. And do not be an extra burden on your host. So that they look forward to inviting not only you again, but they look forward to inviting others into their homes as well. 
right? So it's very important. And one of the key factors here that I, I want to highlight and I'll conclude with this, is it specifically happened about the Prophet And the reason for that was because of how loving and generous and friendly and kind and gracious he was with people and how close people felt to him. It specifically happened there to remind us of the fact that these types of lines and boundaries are oftentimes crossed more so with the people that we feel very, very close to. Which is why we think it's okay. But we have to remember it's not okay in that situation. And we never know when somebody's shyness or somebody's, you know, just modesty is preventing them from saying something about it. But you're really burning and destroying your relationship there. Because not everyone has the heart of the Messenger Wasallam, Where they won't take it personally. But this damages and breaks relationships over time. But it's much, much better to be very cognizant, to be very balanced, to be very moderate, to be very dignified and intelligent in how we interact with people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability to practice everything was, that was said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasakfirukum wa natubu